hear the sound difference. Hey, Dr. Rob. Great. Hey, Dr. Tammy. <laughs> so we have a question. This is a good one. What is the biggest changes you see in the men in your treatment center from when they check in to when they check out? Thank you. They come alive. That's the best word I can use. They come to life. It's like stick-like figures walk in and say like, here I am, I'm a guy, I'm in trouble. And they have no, it's, it's like taking someone whose world is black and white and turning it into color. All of a sudden they see, I think the subtleties of how they affect other people of, I mean, they're living in a community. So everything they do, everything they say, everything they, every way they respond is reflected black to them. They get to learn about where they show up, where they don't, where they're present, where they're not. I think a lot of, I think, so I, I guess the best thing I could say is I think they wake up. I think they come to life. And it's all of a sudden, I think it's not all of a sudden, it's a lot of work. The people I work with begin to see themselves as a much, not as someone who could disappear and just go away and do something and then come back and no one ever knew. They see themselves as a part of everything a part of community a part of family a part of i think they learn that they cannot go off and go do something anywhere anytime without having a profound effect on themselves and everybody and that's a very different look way of looking at the world than somebody who just says well i'll go off and have an affair and no one will know so i think that nobody leaves here's one more thing i'll say and this is not new about treatment but this is a good thing to say um, we ruin the acting out one of our jobs is that nobody goes back out there and does it again without understanding how it's going to affect the people they love and themselves. And so I think one of the things that treatment centers in general do is ruin using for people. You may go back to it, but you know what it's going to cost you. You know what it's going to cost others. And you never have that feeling of um, kind of naivete, like, oh, this is fun and I can do this and no one will know. Now you know. And I don't think that ever goes away. Um, yeah. Any additions, Tammy? You, you yeah, know I do. Um, I, I had several thoughts. One was from a therapist who commented, mm, I don't remember exactly when, but not too long after her client was back. And um, uh, it was a female therapist and she met with her client and she said, he looks different. It, it, like it, his countenance is different. And I thought, I believe that because I think the shame and the guilt and all that garbage that you know people addicts are carrying around with them they, they don't have to continue that so it's kind of like ah oh. and and I've had it from partners as well they've talked about um like they see a difference you know so that there it's not just um I do believe I you know I believe that we start being connected in a real and meaningful way but but they're also able to show up in different ways so that that their loved ones see them as different and I think that's a huge thing you know um uh b because then you're starting to have that interaction and it isn't you know just in the silos of dissociation that we you know w that we bring in so Hopefully that helps, but yeah, I mean, I am obviously a big fan of the expert treatment. I love treatment. It's yeah. like a bath and it's, it's like growing up. I, a lot of times, oops, I'm looking for a pad to write on. Um, I think I've been told, and I would agree with this statement, that I've spent many years turning boys into men. And I think I really teach men their responsibilities and where they need to show up and how some of their desires are not ones that match where they are in life and that they have to be more responsible people. And uh, yeah, I will tell you though, Tammy, I've never said this to you, but the biggest concern of every man who leaves treatment, have I told you this? No. Is my wife gonna leave? Oh mm -hmm. my God, I understand what I did. I understand what it's cost, I get it. And oh my God, now I see what I have to lose. And oh. I think a lot of them, when you sit in group on their last couple of days, they're like, oh, I just had a talk with her. I don't know. You Now they realize what a family was, how important that was, what a spouse was, how hard that is to find. Like they kind of wake up and realize what they've had and they're terrified all of a sudden of losing it. Whereas before it was like, oh, I can do this and no one will know. I think that's a really important point because, well, let me just say this. One more thing about treatment because I love it. love talking about it. I often talk to the guys and I do groups with the guys and uh, uh, they get a little scared when I come in because I often know things and pull out things and throw it at them in a nice, sometimes not so nice way. But um, what was I gonna say about that? But one of the things that the men say to me all the time, and I think that you guys will relate to this, is 
I often say things to them, like I'll, I'll be in a group and I'll say, blah, 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 blah. And they'll say to me, how did you know that? You know, and what I'm saying to them is this isn't okay. You need to do it this way. That's not fair to your spouse, blah, blah, blah. And they say, why did, how did you know that? I'm like, well, that's obvious. And they say, but my wife has been saying that to me for three years. And you said it and I could hear it. And I think one of the, sorry wives, but I think that you get, dismissed for so long oh she's just nagging or boyfriends whatever he's just giving me a hard time you know that you get pushed away for so long be in responding to things that are actually true but you get pushed away like it doesn't matter i don't want to hear that leave me alone and finally you know the authority figure comes and says the exact same thing that you do they're like wait a minute maybe i should have been paying attention to my family's important. i have to show up on dinner on time i'll never date unless i stop doing this i mean they kind of get it and, um, and that's really, really, so yeah, I think treatment is amazing, but only for those truly who want their lives to change. It doesn't mean that you, most people come to treatment. I'm saying one more thing. Sorry, I can't stop talking about treatment. I love it. I've been doing it for 25 years, my whole career. Um, I'm defending my right to talk on my own conversation show. I want to say that. I'm a um, all right, well, why don't we go on to more questions? I could no, no, opine, no. opine. No. no, no, you go. I could well, opine on that forever. So Dr. Robin, well, Dr. Rob and I talked about, we just talked about this about a week ago, and he said, you know, our, our 14 day program, it's like doing two years plus of, tr of therapy, you know, of weekly therapy, you know, in this condensed. Uh, and I think it's so helpful because, you know, going to weekly therapy, you don't have the structure in place. Um, it's hard to be in the in between and not really have the tools to use and, and not, people lie a lot. Try not to act out, but jeepers, I don't have it any different, you know, so, so to get that condensed, um, uh, you know, time to, to really push through and make a lot of progress. It, and I also want to call you on, because you said to go back to the fun of acting out. And I'm like, I think there probably was some fun at some point, but then it's chasing the fun that you think you're going to have. And it's less about the fun mm -hmm. that you're having, because that was my experience anyway. I was like, well, I had fun once. I should be able to find that again. And that was very elusive. So, okay. So ready for the next question? Yes, I'm just telling my spouse to go get the dog. Okay, all right. Otherwise, the dog will scratch on the door, and I don't yeah. want that to happen. Okay, yeah. I'm back. So the <laughs> next one is, I'm still trying so hard to understand addiction. I wonder how an individual's brain can hijack them and cause them to cheat on their partner. I also wonder if addicts ever stop this behavior on their own, and if they are ever moments of clarity when they could stop on their own. Hard to believe that they act out for so many years before getting caught. Well, that's about nine questions. Yes. So I'm thinking so at least. I, Do you have whatever one you want to pick out of that? Well, the, the first piece is I wonder how an individual's brain can hijack them and cause them to cheat on their partner. So let's talk a little bit about what really happens. Okay, the way addiction is evolved is that children, very, very young children, have difficult experiences. That could mean neglect, that could be a whole bunch of things that can happen to them. And children learn how to survive difficult experiences by using fantasy. So I had a mentally ill mom and she was often in and, off ho in and out of hospitals. She was very inappropriate. She'd walk around naked and sometimes she would attack people. It was very sad. And when things were very, very difficult, I would run over to the window in my bedroom and I'd close the door and I'd look outside and I'd see the cars going by and I would count them and I would make little lists of the cars and I could see a Buick from a, the other thing I learned to do was read and I would read and read and read and I would take the same book and read it 12 times and I read the encyclopedia and what I was, in, it was in my room. And the point was, is that I found a place to go in my head where I didn't have to deal with anything that was going on around me. I could just be there. And because children are not sophisticated enough to say, oh, well, I'm just sad because that's going on over there. You know, they don't know what's going on. They're just looking for a place to feel better. And if the people who love them aren't making them feel better, then they've got to go themselves to find a place. I learned to space out, look out the window. Oh, I can tell you this day, if I'm reading a book or I'm watching TV and someone comes up to me and starts talking to me, I don't hear them because I learned to deeply disappear into the things. That was how I survived. I don't hear a thing when I'm reading. And I think sex, it was a natural extension of that. It was an intense, exciting, emotional place to go that left me thinking about nothing but that. And everything else went away. And I think that 
that the learned experience of fantasy over and over finding places to go to survive in fantasy and perhaps in some ways either being sexualized as a child or finding ways to comfort oneself through sexual touch, the sex becomes a part of it. So it's a very early learned behavior. Most sex addicts I work with would say, gee, I knew something wasn't right when I was 14. You know, long before they met, and they, I knew I was different in some way around sex or dating. It's often the kid who, like when people are making out, he knows what he's doing. It's not like the other kid is like fumbling around. He's going for something. He knows what he's looking for. He's, going to, he's already going to try to take advantage of that situation at some level. He's 14. So this starts very early in very various forms, and it plays out as it does over life because it does not get resolved. What was the next piece? The next piece is I also wonder if acts ever stop this behavior on their own. All right. So I'm going to be really honest with you folks. Um, I've never said this before, uh, but I'll say this part first. If I had a thousand sex addicts in front of me, 995 of them would have gone to treatment because they wanted to get out of trouble. Most people in life who enter treatment go to treatment because not because they want to be a better person, not because they want to make somebody happy, not because they um, want to grow. They go because they want to get out of what they're in trouble about, 995 out of 1,000. And I don't care that people are not motivated for treatment when they arrive. They're motivated enough to be there to get out of their trouble. And my job is to take that motivation and turn it around and say, look at yourself, look at how you got here, look at what you've done and how we can fix it. And, um, and we proceed to try to fix it. So um, I don't think that most people on their own just randomly decide to get well and go get help. Here's the thing I've never said. I'm one of the five. I enter treatment because I, was, didn't want to be lonely anymore. I wanted to have a relationship. I didn't like the way my life was going. And I knew this was a place where I could get help. So I didn't have a relationship. I wasn't in trouble. I, I just wanted to have a life and I couldn't. And I knew why. I mean, it was obvious to me why. Um, so, you know, I, I'm pretty happy about that. Actually, I feel kind of good about that. Never told you that, Tammy. Never told anyone that. But, um, but the reality is that, my, and I had consequences too. I couldn't date. I couldn't meet people. I couldn't be sexual in the way I wanted. I couldn't hold on to somebody when I was just at that time when I wanted to have a relationship. It's just they weren't the same kind of consequences that most people have when they join treatment. Did that answer that? Yes, you're doing great. So then the next okay, thing you. is, um, are there moments of clarity when they could stop on their own? Yes. Every addict has a moment where they think, what am I doing? What am I doing here? This is crazy, but it doesn't last. Exactly. It's drummed out by the, uh, I shouldn't do this. I don't want to be here. Oh, but look at that. And oh, this could be fun. And then their own neurochemical process of fantasy and dissociation takes over and they disappear. And so what you have to understand about acting out is it's just like drinking, just like gambling. Intellectual thought is not much of a part of it. The brain is overrun by adrenaline, oxytocin, endorphins. It's run by the, it's overrun by the, our neurochemicals of mood. So when I want to go act out, I'm filled with adrenaline and endorphins. And I, it's like, it's like um, being in tremendous fear combined with excitement and and enthusiasm. So instead of just being afraid, I'm, I'm afraid and excited. The adrenaline's there, but so are the other hormones that make me feel good. But when you get afraid, when adrenaline shows up, you really lose your ability. You become tunnel vision. It's like if there's a fire, I got to get out. If there's an earthquake, you know, you get very focused on what you need to do in that moment. And that's kind of what addiction is like. There's a fight or flight piece, which is excitement and fantasy driven. And then the person gets into the behavior and it starts to feel good. And you've got all that intensity combined with the excitement. And it's very hard to turn away and say, no, we say that someone is on the way to acting out is like a rock rolling downhill. You know, maybe at the beginning they could say, ooh, this isn't a good idea. But by the time they actually get to the behavior, it's too late. And Ka Tammy, you're rocking back and forth. Are you praying? Oh, no, I'm way? agreeing with you. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm thought, totally, oh, yep, I'm, yep. I'm, this is know, the, I'm in agreement with Dr. Okay, because, you know, Jews daven and they do it like oh. this. So I was thinking, oh, Tammy's praying in some yeah. way. Okay, sorry, got that. Yeah. Let's go. Well, so the, the tail end of it was hard to believe they act out for so many years before getting caught. And I'm like, we are very good at, you know, lying at, to ourselves and to everyone else and manipulating the situation. And, oh, yeah, I'm just going out for, you know, coffee with a friend, you know, whatever. So, yeah. You know what we're playing off of? We know that you would never think we'd be doing that. 
we know that that would be the last thing that you would think. So we're constantly playing against your faith in us and your, we don't think of it that way, but it's like, oh, I'll just tell him or her that and they'll believe that. Or even if they don't believe that, they wouldn't think I was doing this because it's so far from what most of you would think any of us are doing that um, oftentimes we'll hear things like, do you have a drug problem? Like, you're disappearing, you're doing, but not the actual thing that we're doing. It would never occur to a partner that we're doing that. So the next question is, as a betrayed partner, what work do you suggest doing to be most open-minded and open-hearted to rebuilding trust? The first thought what I had was get a gun, but I guess that isn't the right answer. <laughs> it was the very first thought. Well, actually I thought knife and I thought, no, no, that's no, not no, right. no. Get a gun. Yeah. No. Okay. So ask the question again, because all I could think about so was violence. as a that's betrayed really partner, what work do you suggest doing to be most open-minded and open-hearted to rebuilding trust? Well, I don't suggest you worry about, okay, if you're a new partner, like this has happened to you recently, I don't think your job is to be open-hearted and to encourage trust. I will tell every partner and every one of you as a partner in the first year, if everything's going well, and he or she's doing the work and getting better, your job is to, three things, get support for yourself, because you've been through hell, um, decide, uh, what, um, decide whether, uh, uh, sorry, take care of yourself, hate him or her and when you feel like it, and decide whether you wanna stay with them or not. That's your only job, to get support, to feel all of your angry and hurt feelings, and to decide whether or not to stay. It is not your job to create a safe and nurturing environment for this person to heal in. It's their job to come home and, and create that for themselves. And that is part of what we treat, teach in treatment. When we have these men working together day after day after day, one of the things they realize is, I like working with other people and I'm growing with other people. So when they leave, they are appointed toward group therapy, group support, 12-step meetings. They are, in a sense, being asked to recreate what we created in treatment for themselves to stay sober. So did I answer the question? Yes, and I, and, okay. and I, I, I use what you've shared before um, is everything that the addict does is is data so so rather than taking in on an emotional level of like oh but I love them you know you do and that's all good but what are their actions showing you what they're doing is the data that you need to be able to evaluate how safe they are for you create strong boundaries for yourself so that you can find out how trustworthy they are I okay. also think that uh, I would read a book. I, as partner, I absolutely read a book I wrote called Pro Dependence, because I really think partners are often caught up in, in the idea that in some way they are at fault. And I'll say this today, as I say to every single week to every single partner, there is never anything that you could ever do to make any of us have sex or masturbate or whatever that is. You can make us angry, you can disappoint us, you can gain 50 pounds, you can nag until the, the, the Lord comes and says, stop. But we do what we want to do because that's what we want to do. If I was upset you with you and I want to get a divorce, I would. If I was upset with you and wanted to see a therapist, I would. If I was upset with you and decided to join a car club to have something to do except hang out with you, I would. But the decision to go drink or use or go have sex with a stranger, that's my response to the stress I'm under. And it is not your responsibility to change my life so that it can be easier for me to not act out. I have to adapt to life the way it is and find new ways of coping. Boy, that was good. <laughs> what's the, the next question is, um, what advice can you give for healing for the spouse whose partner chooses not to get recovery leading to a divorce? I'm gonna ask you to answer that one, Tammy. Sometimes the questions I think, I think I'd just like to hear your heart okay. on that one and then so I'll my, go. My thought is, I would love to see you do some work with a grief therapist, somebody who could help you with trauma and grief, because it's grieving the loss of what you, you know, it's grieving the loss of what you had hoped for, grieving the loss of the relationship, um, you know, understanding that there are aspects, it's not all good, it's not all bad. Um, and it's sad when um, uh, I, I, had, I had a friend reach out to me and it was a combination of, of addiction, but they, you know, someone died as a result of that. And I really struggled with that this morning because, you know, I, I hate it when addiction wins. And so to me, this mm. is like grieving that addiction wins. Um, but I honor you for um, choosing to, to move forward. I mean, that's a hard decision to make. So I honor you for uh, choosing to understand that you've got data and that person is not going to 
um, choose to, to be healthy and for you to have an opportunity for a different path for you. So yeah, I want people to choose you. life. I want yeah. people to choose life, your own life. Mm -hmm. You know, how long have you been worried about this? How long has this been on your mind? How long have you, if the, you know, we have a saying in therapy and I think it's perfect for you spouses, actually more than perfect. We say in therapy that we are never supposed to work harder than our clients. So I can make suggestions. I can give them ideas. I can encourage them. But if I find myself every week kind of reminding and new things and why aren't they doing this and trying to encourage and cajole and then they're not doing their job. And they're leaving me trying to rev them up to go do what they're supposed to do. And that is not my job either. They need to find the motivation and the willingness within themselves to move forward. I can encourage them. I can kick them in the butt a little bit. But ultimately, that is never your job as a spouse to try to encourage them to get better. You can just take care of you and talk about what you are willing to tolerate or not. Um, and let go of your focus on him or her because their lives are their responsibility. But, and it's okay to be sad, you know, I mean, like, oh my God. part of it is like, d don't shut that down, y you know, get support to move through that because it is, it's incredibly sad. So, you know, I hear from people, I just want to say this, Tammy, often on Friday nights, I don't know if you guys know this, but I do a very similar experience on a, on a, a program called in the rooms.com every Friday night. And I often hear people, spouses in particular come up or, or girlfriends and they'll say, you know, it's been a year and a half. And I know there's something wrong with me because I'm still thinking about him or her. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. When you love someone, you love them. And even if they hurt you, you don't just block them out and they don't, you know, you may have to come to terms with what that love was and what it wasn't. But whether you separate or not, when you separate, if you separate, the feelings you have for that person are never going to go away. Um, they will, I mean, they will ebb over time. But these women and think there's something wrong with them. They miss their ex. And I'm like, I miss my ex from 30 years ago. We were great friends. I'm glad we're not together. But boy, I really think about this person and I wish them well. You know, I don't, I just, yeah, I don't think you're doing, uh, anyway, I want to stop there. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Okay. Next question. Thoughts about a recovering essay who's been sober for a year and honest for eight months with huge improvement in how he acts towards me and the kids, but is still reluctant to explore anything about the childhood roots of his addiction or the internal triggers, you know, outside of boredom for acting out. Therapy is everything for this disorder. I mean, we have a phrase in AA called dry drunk. Maybe you've heard of it. I want to explain what it means. It's probably a phrase some of you have heard, never knew what it meant. A dry drunk is someone who has chosen and found the ability to stop drinking, but they have not chosen a path of self-awareness and personal growth. And if you think about the fact that it was their emotional life or their lack of it that led them to drink in the first place, if they don't do something to grow and replace what led them to drink, they're just going to be unhappy, angry people. And I find that people who just stop, even though they are living the life that you might want them to live, they're often very unhappy on the inside because they don't know how to soothe um, the disruptions that led them to acting out in the past. They often are just kind of shut down people who don't have sex anymore. <laughs> so, you know, and that's not everyone. Some people are well able to hear themselves psychologically with a lot of support and maybe being involved with their church or, you know, whatever it is, but childhood, complex childhood trauma requires an expert. It's just like if you had a brain injury or, you know, your arm had not healed properly when you broke it when you were seven, you need somebody who knows what they're doing. You wouldn't just go out and break your arm and say, oh, I'll just make sure it heals. You'd want to go somebody who's an expert. These are exquisitely difficult problems. It's taken me many years to really be an expert, 20 years maybe. Um, you want to find an expert and he really will be, tell him this, he'll be a better father if he learns more about what he needs and he'll understand in that way what his family needs. And I, like, I always think leaning into the difficult is where the real healing is and it's where we unload all the garbage that we're carrying. So, so being afraid of having to do that, I get it, but, but um, we're preventing ourselves from, from getting rid of the the pain that we're carrying around so so it it's negative for you it's negative for the kids it's negative for him too so 
I hope you. And there's a lot of what we call. There's another phrase that goes along with dry drunk. We call it white knuckling, mm -hmm. which is kind of holding on to make sure I don't do it. But so much energy goes into just not doing it that the person is not moving ahead. You know, and you're just as miserable. You just and miserable to be around. Um, you know, so so yeah, whoop de doo. You're like not using. Well, you might know. as well go watch some porn. Yeah, it'd be easier to live with. So, okay, next question. What do you recommend for treating the narcissism that has been party to acting out? All addicts well, are so every addict, that. right. Mm -hmm. Every addict is narcissistic by nature. Addiction itself is a narcissistic disorder. Narcissism means, you know, I come first. I'm the only one matters. I don't think about others. I don't have empathy for how my behavior might affect others. I think I can pretty much get away with anything. And so, and I come first. So if you think about, let's say the heroin addict who robs his children's college fund to get money to buy drugs he acts that you think that guy's no morality, no intact values. He's stealing from his children. But I've worked with many an addict who, you know, is sober six months and they go out and work that third job to pay that money back because they want to make sure that their kids have the money they need for school. So when someone is actively addicted, yes, they are only thinking of themselves. But in recovery, there can be a great flowering of connection and interest in the needs of other people. And I see that every day, that's what we do in treatment. That's part of going from black and white into color. So the next question is, I understand deeply what you said about men leaving treatment and wondering if their wife will leave them. First, I'm a gay, I am gay and at this time single. I threw away the precious gift I had of a relationship, but that's done. My question, as a single gay man in treatment, what would you suggest I focus on? Well, I did write a book for gay men called Cruise Control. And if you haven't, Understanding Gay Men and Sex Addiction, and there's a whole section in Cruise Control about dating and how gay men can date in a world where there's such hypersexuality and such a focus on sex and casual sex in the gay communities, different than the heterosexual community. So I wrote a book on how to negotiate that world and figure out how to do simple things like go to the gym or go on a date, which can be very tricky in that world. So uh, I'll make about 12 cents. Feel free to read, read Cruise Control. You know, I always say that. I want to qualify that. When you go to a publisher and you have a book published, they actually make about 94% of the sales. So when I say I make 12 cents off a book, I mean I make 12 cents. And I only say that because I don't want you to think I'm referring to my books to make money. I really don't. Um, if there's a good book on the topic, you'll hear me come out with it. Um, but in this case, um, what book was I talking about? You know, I got to tell them, I took some medication for some sinus stuff I had or whatever, and I cannot remember my name. So I'm doing my best here. Cruise control. Pretty, thank you. But also, um, you know, I would not date as a sex addict, the heterosexual, straight, whatever you are, unless I had a, um, at least one or two people in my life who knew my history, knew my stuff, and I would call them my posse. And I would not date unless my posse is involved. So these are people I know my whole history. They know what I've done. They know what I'm looking for. You might create a dating plan very much like you have a sex plan that tells you what is good dating, what is problem dating, what is healthy dating. You can go over that with a sponsor. You can go on every date and call someone before one of these trusted people and call them after. You can make a commitment to not have sex for a while. So you actually get to know the person. I think there's a lot of things that you can do to, to consciously date and that's not really something most people want to do healthy people god love them they can just go unconscious and moonbeams and starlight oh i just love that part. but we make bad choices under those circumstances so there's nothing wrong with our dating we just need other people to help us make good decisions one more thing if you're and this is for everybody if you were dating someone and you think oh i don't want my family to meet them or i don't think they get along with my friends that's a bad thing Part of dating is you want to bring this person in and around the people in your life. You want them to approve, to validate it. Watching this person with your family and friends helps inform you who they are. And I worry about the person who says, oh, I don't really want to introduce this person to people I know. Why not? <laughs> so anyway, just a thought about dating. Well, and I want to tag on because you're asking about what should I concentrate on treatment? First of all, whatever your cl clinical team says. But I'm think what really threw me was, I threw away the precious gift I had of a relationship. So mm. 
how can you be the person that isn't going to throw that away when you do have someone that you care about next time? So becoming that person um, that isn't lying and cheating and thinking only about me, et cetera, I would invite you to explore that. And next, I would also ask you, go ahead. You know, well, relationships look a lot better in retrospect than they are when you're having them. And they look a lot better when you're alone than when you were in them. So let me tell you something a really wise therapist told me about dating. I had broken up with someone and all I could think about was that I was single. And I was like, all I could think about was, why did I do that? And I miss him and why we shouldn't have, and we had such good times that I was, you know, in the dating mess. And so I went to my therapist and I said, you know, that person I was dating, well, we broke up and I, all I can think about is why this and why that and I should have. And he said to me, you know what? I really need you to understand this. He said, whoever you were when you were dating them and whatever you had with them and whoever they were, that's it. That's who you are together. What we as therapists can teach you guys, we can teach you to be more honest, have more integrity, how to communicate better, how to listen. But who you are as a person, I can't help with that. I can tell you today that if I started acting out, my husband would be really disappointed in me and really upset, but I wouldn't lose him because he's someone who trusts and believes in me enough to know that I'll come around and work on it. So I wouldn't always say that I threw the whole thing away. It's really a two part deal. You may have done things that left that person feeling they couldn't live with you anymore, but I don't think that's the same as throwing someone away. Good response, good add on. Okay, so next question. Does porn addiction change how the addict views their spouse and relationship? For example, remembering a marriage as not being the great that great and their spouse not caring about them. And also why would an addict constantly threaten divorce or tell their spouse to just leave when they get pissed off? So there's two questions. One is- Okay, I wanna answer the second one change? first. Okay, all right, go ahead. Yeah, ready? Ask, sure. Uh, can you ask? So it says, why um, would the addict constantly threaten divorce or tell their spouse to just leave when they get pissed off? Because they're an asshole. Okay. They're someone who doesn't understand the meaning of their relationship, how deeply important it is to be connected. That's someone who doesn't want to be bothered to show up and have show respect for their partner and how they feel. And really, it's a threat. It's like, if you won't put, what, put up what I'm doing, then you can go somewhere else. And my best response to that is find yourself an apartment. <laughs> Give him what he wants. You don't believe that I should, you know, I'm, I just have to put up with this. No, I don't. Because no, you don't. If you have the resources on any level to get out of there, you can show him how unwilling you are to put up with his crap. So I just think that's really awful behavior. It's not bad enough to hurt you. Now he's telling you you have to live with it. Not okay. I tell him to leave, quite frankly. So okay. <laughs> yeah. Why do you have to give up that whatever you're anyway? So um the other question was, um, does porn addiction change how the addict views their spouse and relationship? Um, if you're very actively looking at a lot of porn, like four or five times a week or over a couple hours a day on the days you do, what happens is that over time, the stimulus of the new, the immediate, the ever-changing becomes your norm. And so sex becomes about a constant array of brand new, different, different every time, new stories, new people, and spouses become boring. Um, spouses are a softy. It's like, you're nothing like all those. It's just what you're all afraid of. You're not all like all those pictures and you don't give me that level of excitement. And so they just don't bother being sexual with you. Or when they do, they're thinking about something else. And that's not what you want to be having. I think the other thing that porn does, if they, someone does it a lot, is they, and this is actually research on this, people who look at a lot of porn um, will start to objectify people in the world more. So if I look at a lot of you know, stuff online, when I, someone walks by me, I don't see them as much. I see their boobs, their butt, their arms. I start to look at people in the same way as I look at them in the porn. The good news is that if you take the porn away, over time, the person starts seeing people as people again. So the brain does reset. But while they're actively looking at porn, people are more like objects than they are like people. Wait a minute, sorry. This is not everyone who looks at porn, and this is not porn in general. This is, we're talking about people who are truly addicted to pornography. Next question, a divorced father and recovering sex addict who was a victim of maternal covert emotional incest, 
physical abuse as well as sexual grooming and molestation. I struggle mightily with articulating my needs and feelings and engaging in emotional intimacy with my current partner. I'm in therapy, not with a CSAT this corona, and it's helping, but I realize that I don't know what my needs and feelings are. Help this nearly 50 year old man to find his inner voice. What can I do now uh, to help myself? That's a great Come question. to treatment. Yeah, I was gonna say. Come, Go come ahead. to treatment. Come to treatment. This is what treatment is for. This is what we do. We teach people how to tolerate and grow intimacy with the other guys, not sexual, but how to accept. I can't tell you how so many of the men say, I've never let myself feel close to anybody like this. I can't believe I've kept my spouse out for so long or my friends out for so long. They don't know how to let people in. And so, um, you know, when you say I am really trying, what you're talking about is a psychological journey not necessarily an addiction journey per se, and you want to grow more, become more alive, more connected, this is the work we're doing. So if you have the resources, come let us help you. I really, really mean that. I mean, I think this is what, I have so many men say I've never felt so alive and connected. That is the point we wake people up. On the other hand though, you know, if the journey you're on is working, just do more of it. How about therapy twice a week? How about going to more groups? How about, you know, if what you're doing is working, do more of it. I often have a guy come to me and treat me when I was doing outpatient and he'd say, oh, I'm having a slip. I'm having a slip. Well, maybe you should see me twice a week. Maybe you should go to meetings Monday, Thursday, and Friday, not just on Sundays. We, we up the ante for that person to do more and more and more. And when you're in treatment, there isn't anything that you can focus on except yourself and the work. You can't get away from it. By the way, and that's a great way by the, um, how do I say this? One of the reasons that I like doing the work we do is we're not a treatment center of a hundred people. When you're in a very large program, people can get lost, especially people who disappear into the corners because in big places, generally it's the squeaky voices that it's the person who's acting out that gets the staff attention, not the person who's just being kind of quiet. So wherever you go, if you choose to look at treatment and I really encourage you to, it'll help you come alive. Look for an environment where you're working with six guys or eight guys or in a small community, not necessarily a place that has 300 people because it's easy to get lost and not do what you need to do there. Next question uh, from the question from the betrayed. I feel like my husband and I are operating in different worlds of reality right now. Since his last relapse six weeks ago, things have not started going in the right direction again. His anger and resentment has only continued to get worse. I began to become fearful of him still being in relapse. I would agree. So I mentioned getting a polygraph because I said every time his behavior is in this manner, he has been in relapse. He scheduled the polygraph and unfortunately has failed two polygraphs this past week, but he is still maintaining his innocence. He is still so angry and resentful at me. I'm considering an, an, in, an in-home separation. We have three young children because he feels unsafe and I no longer have a realistic conversation with him. I want to set new boundaries. Suggestions for when the spouses are on such different pages? Tammy, do you have any thoughts about that one? Uh, well, my first thought was, yeah, I absolutely, you know, would, if he was in recovery, well, first of all, I always go, if he's abstinent, you would start to see a difference. If he's sober, you would see a difference. He's a long ways from recovery, but you know, like that, that whole attitude, like, so not okay. So you setting healthy boundaries, I, you know, I a hundred percent, you know, I was just talking to somebody before this webinar and it was like, set healthy boundaries. And if he starts showing that he can maintain those, great, you know, then the boundaries get a little different. But, you know, when things are going the opposite direction, it's the boundaries get bigger. They have to, you, you know, you've got three young children. You need to be safe. Your children need to be safe. So safety absolutely has to be the highest priority. And if he's not willing to step up, so even if he says, okay, I, you know, I really, I've not acted out, he's still acting out because this whole anger and all of this, you know, resentment, that's, that's acting out. I mean, that is not, that's not okay in any way, shape or form. So, sorry. You know what I would do is if I was involved with this person, I don't know, I have, you know, thoughts come to me and I just say them. That's how I got here. Um, I would grab that man's hand and go look at the children while they're sleeping and give him a real good time to look at those children and say, this is what you have to lose. See these babies here and me, this is what you're gonna lose. No argument, no drama, just the reality. Look at those babies. 
I can find someone else to parent them other than you if I need to. I can parent them if I need to. Do you want to be part of this? Look at those children and think about it. And then I'd walk away. <laughs> That's what I would do. Look, let him look at the reality of what he's looking at. Oh, by the way, I might, I might follow that with, oh, and by the way, you're sleeping in the basement for a while. And if you decide not to do that, I'm going to kick your ass out. I, Tammy will say that I am much more assertive as time goes by with pushing spouses to, to be more clear and take the steps that you're afraid of. I have done this work for a very long time, and especially I have found more recently, probably because we talk to so many spouses and we hear their stories of what they're struggling with. Y'all put up with way too much. I would kick their butt out unless I didn't have the financial resources or I you know, had some real issue with children and childcare. But if I could, I would never let myself be treated the way some of you guys do. And you call me and you write us and you say, well, he did this and he did that and he did this. And what do you think I should do? I'm like, kick him the F out. Because sometimes we only will wake up when we see what we have to lose. And it's perfectly fine to change the locks. I'm okay. Let him stand out there and try to get in while you're calling the police if he breaks a window. I mean, that's what we're talking about. He is violating your family and you need to, don't you understand? We're not there. We're not doing our most basic job, which is to take care of you and our family. That's our primary job, just like your job is to take care of us and our family. I'm not being sexist here. It's a pair job. I am not doing my job. You not only have to do my job and your job, but you've got to help me understand that I can't keep doing this and get all the benefits that I've been getting, which is time with you, time with family, kids, fun. That's going to go away. I have to make a choice. And while you spouse is kind of, well, should I, I don't want to be too mean because he might act out. You're giving away the prize, my opinion. Sorry, spouses, I don't be hard on you. I want you to have everything you want. But sometimes I think you're just way too deferential to us and we will use it. Trust me. Agree. More data, like we we're talking about. So this next one is, I'm a single gay man and I am a sex addict. In my addiction, I am very turned on by anonymous sex with many men who walk into my hotel or apartment. I do not see their face and we never talk. This is not the only type of sex that I like, but I, I also like having sex with people I know well and do things outside of the bedroom. Is this part of the person's sexual templates or is that a sign of issues from childhood? Well, look, everybody gets to have whatever kind of sex they want, whenever they, however they want, as long as it's consensual, as long as it's legal. Um, there is nothing wrong with picking someone up on an app and having sex with different people five times a day. I think that's fine. I think that you can drink as much as you want, use as much as you want, gamble as much as you want. It is never, addiction is not quantifiable. It's not based on how often you do this or what kind of, it's not based on what kind of sex you have or how often you have it. Addiction is based on how life, how functional is your life? So if you're doing this does not affect the other parts of your life and you think, well, no big deal. You know, I can do this and I can have relationships. I can do this and do my job. Heck, do whatever the hell you want. But most people who are sitting in this space with me and Tammy are sitting here because their lives are not working and they're not happy with the way they've been doing things. You must understand, I'm speaking to you directly. If you're an alcoholic, you don't get to drink. That's the way it goes. Other people do. Other people get to go to champagne parties and, you know, get drunk on, on New Year's Eve and toast their daughter's wedding. But you don't, if you're an alcoholic, you got to put grape juice in that cup. And it's the same thing if you're a gay sex addict. You don't get to go have anonymous sex with anyone you want, whenever you want, even though other people may be able to, because you have an identifiable problem that is causing your life to dissolve. Once you, if you believe that, then yes, you have to change your behavior. And no, every other person doesn't have to. That's none of your business. I can't say what's good for everyone. What I can say is what's good for you. Actually, I can't say that. I can only say that it has to be good for you. For a long time, anonymous sex worked for me. I had many, 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 many partners, probably many more than you ever had. Um, ha ha. <laughs> Not a competition. And my life wasn't working. I wasn't happy. I wasn't connected. I, I, I was all alone inside myself with one partner after another. And that wasn't satisfying to me. I didn't want to live that way anymore. You know, I didn't want, I didn't want to live that way in my mid twenties. 
So I can only imagine how some of you in your 30s, 40s, and 50s feel like, oh my God, I'm in this box I can't get out of. You can. So this is something only you can decide. If the kind of sex I'm having is fun and I like it, it's causing no problems in my life that I can identify, and it's not a secret. My friends know that I step out once in a while. It's no, you know, I'm not, have a good time. Is kink wrong? Is fetish an addiction? No. Is lying to yourself an addiction? Is ruining your life? Yeah, that sounds a little bit more like an addiction. By the way, what kind of sex you have? Are you safe? I heard something, I have to say this, Tammy. Into my hotel. That's what I heard. Huh. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. F f nameless, faceless. Into my hotel and apartment. So into like, my hotel. So I don't know what that means. Do you work in a hotel? Do you do you clean rooms and stop off in every room? Do you, you know, some people do. Some people work in, in hotels. So just so they can stop in every room whenever they want to and have sex. Here's a good question for you, and I'll let this go. How much of your life is set up around sex as a priority, as opposed to friendship, recreation? you know what all the other thing family and all the other things that have meaning in life how much of your life is set up around finding sex and having it and is that making you happy only you can discern that yeah well and and when i was reading it i was like oh that sounds so lonely you know because like it's just it's just body parts it's like you know and oh i'm all turned down but yeah it's just body parts and like we talked about earlier i'm chasing the fun that i think i'm having but it isn't you know i i don't know so but they get and I'll get, I'll get even more. I'm sorry, Tammy. I'm talking no. to you over you. Go ahead. No, I hadn't. I was done. Go for it. I also, as a sex addict, who used to do the things you do. Every time I itched, what do I have? Every time something, I had a sore throat. What have I got? In other words, I lived in constant fear that there, I was going to catch a disease. Forget HIV. How about STDs? How about HPV? How about herpes? Like every single time. And then I was in a relationship. What am I bringing home? So, or what are you catching that's going to make someone in a future relationship say, gee, I'm really sorry. I don't date people with herpes, you know, or people with HPV. So you may be cutting yourself out, you know, anyway, I would think through the whole thing and not just a little bit. Oh, there's one more thing about anonymous sex that you may not think about. People have cameras especially in hotel rooms. And they'll stick their little camera in a corner and you'll walk in that room and you'll have sex with them and then you'll be on the internet for everybody to see. That, that happens right. all the time. Yeah. Okay. So and next you know what? Question. They go up as lawyer videos. Oh. Next question. My wife is doing a great job of hating me. At what point does her anger cross the line and become, begin to be ineffective for both of us, the one who betrayed her? Well, I think there's a lot of pieces to that. Number one, if me as the spouse who is an addict is doing all the stuff I need to do, I'm going to 12-step meetings or I'm going to groups, I'm going to therapy, I'm showing up on time, I'm being helpful in the home, I'm participating, I'm not being defensive. I read Out of the Doghouse, which is my book for men who cheat, and I understand what my spouse is going through fully, and therefore I'm going to really follow the direction in there and respect her. If you're doing everything right, and, I, and it's a lot, um, not perfectly, but you know, really seem like you're trying, I give it a year for your partner to be on what we call the roller coaster, to be ambivalently loving you, hating you one day and loving you the next. I think if you're doing everything right, that's eight months to a year, but it should be a slow, kind of a little less and a little less and a little less, but they're still gonna be reactive. However, after a year, maybe, going on a year and a half, I will say to spouses, you know, at a certain point, your anger can become unproductive. And the message that you want to give this person with your anger is actually, they already got that message. They're acting on that message. And now you're just pushing them away. Because if someone's really working hard to be the person you want them to be, you need to take that into account. And even though you are angry, go to your group of women and rage. And then come back and say, been mad. I, got, I was really mad at the husbands tonight. We all got pretty pissed. But don't constantly bring your anger to him. I think it's important for every spouse to have a place to go where they can vent. Because we need some space from you, even your anger, even though we deserve it. Because we have to grow and we have to heal. And if you're constantly after us, it pushes us at a certain point, it pushes us away. 
On the other hand, I have seen addicts after three months, when are you going to get over it? It's been four months. Why aren't you know? And it's a good year. Let me give them a metaphor, if that's okay, Tammy. Please. I use this when I talk. Um, so imagine that you run a small business, let's say a dry cleaner or whatever it is, and you hire some young person to work for you, you need the help, and they're doing a really good job, and they're really kind of a needful kid, you like them, but you know they're not doing well at home, whatever. And one day you come in early, they have the keys, they opened up, and you saw them, they didn't know you were there, taking money out of the petty cash box. Not a lot, 10, 15 bucks. And you walk up to them and you know they know and you know and you have this long conversation, but you have a feeling for this kid. You think maybe he's just desperate. So you let it go, you write him up, you tell him if it ever happens again, blah, blah, blah. And he's and you were right. He's been a great employee, it's never happened again, you're always checking, and, and it's been great and fine, and he regrets having ever done it. Great, you made the right decision. However, if four years later you go to work early one day and you see that same guy in front of the petty cash box as you're walking into work. It doesn't matter if he is just cleaning it with Windex. That idea of what he did four years ago will always be there and it will come right back up. I wonder if he's what he, back at what he was doing again. And I tell you that story because I want to put it in a completely different context. What betrayal is like and how easily it can be re-engaged when someone is simply doing something that reminds someone something of what they used to be doing. So it really requires on the part of the addict a great awareness about living differently and acting differently if they wanna keep their relationships and or they want their relationships to be happy. And I hope that your wife is getting pro-dependent aligned support. If, um, you, there, as Dr. Rob mentioned, we have betrayed partner pro-dependent aligned um, uh, free groups, so free, free groups, drop in groups you know, here. So I'm just going to take a moment because um, there's a cruise control, you know, the, for the uh, person that identified as gay that follows immediately right after this as a drop in group. Wait, Tammy, uh, or, can you go back and just tell them what you're introducing? Because you're talking about the groups, but some people are here for the first group. time. So a yeah, drop but can you explain group. this? Can hold up? Can you explain the site and what we do and just give a bigger introduction? Because some people don't know a thing. Thanks. Sure. If you've landed here on YouTube, which you might have, um, on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, all spelled out, you will find links to podcasts, the webinars live. You can join the webinars live or drop-in groups. And a drop-in group is a different format. It's a Zoom platform where you can connect with other people. And we've got betrayed partner from a pro-dependent standpoint, drop-in groups. We've got multiple men's groups. There are four every week, plus the cruise control drop-in group uh, for, for gay, gay men right after this. And, um, but we've got an old lady posse, which is for women, they named it uh, for women of a certain age and, uh, you know, no, no kiddos at home. Um, so there's all kinds of support on sexandrelationshiphealing.com that you can plug into to get some support. That said, I get a number of requests all the time for people looking for um, a therapist or other support, and I'm happy to do so. Tammy, T-A-M-I, at SeekingIntegrity.com. Let me know where you're located because, you know, even though it's COVID and everybody goes, oh, you can do it across state lines. No, their license is for a certain state, and, and so I do need to know that. And I'll do my best um, to help you find qualified support to really help you. Not 100% every now and then somebody goes, that person used codependence and blame me. I'm sorry. You know, I do my best. Um, um, but um, there are, what Dr. Rob said about each of you having support and having your own place to um, to talk is really important. Event. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am, uh, Tammy would agree. I'm at heart a social worker. That was what I was licensed originally. And I got my PhD in other things, but in sexology, but I'm at heart a social worker. And to be a social worker means that you're always looking for opportunities to help others where others in need. That's who we are. And so I, having been a recovering sex addict for 35 years, it was very clear to me that there's a need for an online community where people who don't have the money for therapy or find, feel uncomfortable in 12 step meetings or, or want to add to what they're doing or couples who are often clueless can just go and learn or support each other. So I have to say Tammy and I created this free site. We got a bunch of lazy therapists 
<laughs> to give some free time. All of them have experience in this area and they are volunteering for us, for you, an hour a week. So we probably have 14 hours of therapists volunteering their time. All of it is monitored. And all of this is a service just like this. We do it for free and we do it so that, and look, I've said this before, some of you will find us and say, oh my God, I want to go to that treatment center. Great. That's what pays for the podcasts, the webinars, the everything. Um, we take what you give us for the work we do and we turn it around and give it back. So if you want to, please stop by one of the groups because it's not a sales pitch and we don't do anything there except support you. So the next couple of questions are, they all kind of are- Similar? On, yeah, they're on a theme. So we're running out of time. So I'm going to kind of- Okay. Combine them. So we've got a partner who's going like, you know, he, he's just not getting it. He's right out of the doghouse, long-term marriage, really frustrated. And then separately, and I don't know that these are connected, but you know, I, I, will I ever get empathy? I've tried a couple times. I stumble around, you know, I keep hurting my wife. So, so let's talk about somebody who's been kind of dabbling around trying and trying. You mentioned it early, get a higher level of help. So let's, let's expand on that a bit. Well, I just, I think the issue that you're talking about is my spouse has stopped or my partner, well, whoever it is, they've learned to stop the behavior or they seem to be stumbling around, but they're really onto something it's and they're really- over, over a year, but yeah. We're but they're still, not nice yeah. people. And yeah. especially a lot of you partners, I don't blame you. You feel like, you know, I put up with so much, the least I could get is somebody who's warm and fuzzy or listens to me or is not so narcissistic or, and the thing is, I really want you to understand, first of all, if we're not in therapy, we're not gonna get there. Trail step programs can help us work on ourselves on every level. But the depth to which we need to explore ourselves is not available in that environment. And so if you want someone to work on the kind of person they are and how they treat other people in the world, it's 15 years in a 12-step program or go to 12-step meetings and get a therapist, they'll go a lot faster. Um, recovery doesn't mean we know how to be a nice person. Recovery doesn't mean that we, can, we actually have empathy for you. Recovery simply means I'm on a road to change and I've stopped my behavior and I'm committed to that road and I'm committed to changing it. Um, it doesn't mean that I know anything about how to be a nice guy. So, and this is really my truth. I had to go to a lot of therapy to learn about situations and people that I didn't understand. You know, I think there's a great arrogance that addicts have because we think we got it together. We got it going on. We know what we're doing. And just because we get sober and we stop the behavior that we felt bad about, doesn't mean we still don't think we rule the universe. And um, so whether it takes, how do I say this? Stopping the behavior is something I can do in a month or two, becoming, or even less, becoming a good person can take a long time. A lot of therapy. I will say, as Tammy wants and encourages me to say that going to treatment certainly will kick your butt and we won't let you get away with being, we do teach people how to live in a family and be a good person, that we do. Um, and that is what wives tell us, that we, I finally have somebody I can work with. But you know, we were, we're broken people. This, and, and let me just say this one last thing to all of you. The problem that we exhibit to you, the cheating, the lying, the sexual behavior, the porn, that is the, that's the part of the iceberg that's, that you can see outside the water. But below it, if you know anything about icebergs, there's a lot more underneath there keeping that little piece afloat. The behavior is a symptom. It's not the problem. People need to get control of the symptoms so they can begin to look at the problem. But sex and porn addiction are an intimacy disorder. And they require more than just stopping the behavior. They require learning how to have an intimate, loving relationship, not just with my partner and myself, but with a lot of people around me. It requires learning how to be a different kind of person. Um, I was quite the asshole for a very long time. Uh, I don't think I knew you as well, Tammy, but you know, uh, the, every meeting is, is a little bit of sandpaper. Every therapy session is a little bit of sandpaper. You don't do that stuff, you're gonna be a rock and you're going to cut people. Anyway, I'm done with metaphors. I'm hungry. It's dinner time. I, and I I'm going to go. That. And there is just one more. And I, for the last question that we didn't get to, I tried to answer some of the other ones, but it's more data. If he is not willing, I, I mean, I just hate that. It's like, if he's not willing to do what I was like, you know, it's more data. And um, at some point he's choosing, like Dr. Rob was talking about, you know, it's like, here's your children who are going to disappear because you're not going to be part of their world. So, so when the consequences for changing um, are, 
high enough when the pain of having to change is less than staying in the muck that they're in, they'll change. So, but if they don't- and I, Now change, I do want to add something about oh, your partners. Please. Yeah. Your switch, your change, and I really mean this and I hope you get this, is going from, why are you doing this and why are you, don't you know what you're doing in the family, but to what do I want? What am I willing? What kind of life do I want? What kind of partner do I want? What kind of respect do I want? Because you cannot shame, yell, and nag someone into being who you want them to be. Trust me. But I've tried. But you can be very clear about what you want and need and then look around and decide what works in that scenario that you've painted for yourself and what doesn't. And then you can let someone else know, acting like that doesn't work for me. And then you walk away when they act like that. But you don't say, you know, you're not a mother. It's not like, do this, do that. You've got to get on. Because that's when they turn you off. They don't hear a thing you say. Anyway, lots of love to you, Tammy. Thank hope you. It's not, hope it's cooling down there in Arizona. It's it is. It's cooler. It is. Yeah. I, I don't think we're going to hit over 100 this week. So. Wow. Well, I'm going to put a sweater on because it's getting there cold. You go. I'll talk to you later. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, Bye. Tammy. Thank you, everybody. Bye.